Uh, I started out in industry and was in the trenches as a software engineer for 10 years before I wandered into academia as a research scientist. I was a single mom working full time doing my PhD at night. Those years were a blur. Um, <laughs> finished my PhD and became a professor. And some of my other passions, as you've heard, I'm a puppy raiser for uh, service dogs. I also am an avid dog trainer in lots of other uh, venues, such as Dog Agility, uh, which we're competing at national levels. I also have a lot of horses. I've had horses my whole life. I compete at international level in dressage. I'm also a dressage judge. And so uh, with all of those passions together, um, my daughter, who is now an adult, uh, we decided that we needed to raise our own veterinarian. And so she's now in vet school, her third year in vet school. <laughs> and she's coming home. She's coming home. So how about you, Adrian? So I also started off in industry, and I tried desperately to let Melody train our dogs, but we had, had two delinquents, I think, so she, <laughs> unfortunately, but we love them still. <laughs> and I, you heard, I love dance, absolutely love dance, and to the point of dance fitness classes, had a brief stint as a dancer for a semi-pro football team, very brief, very, very brief. <laughs> But still, I've infused that into our children. So we have a five-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy. And so fortunately for my non-dancing husband, they are my partners on the floor. So this, this has worked out well. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a conversation between the two of us. And you've already heard that we are in the brain-computer interface arena. So I want to broadly pose to Melody, what attracted you first to research? In industry, I loved being in industry. I loved making things and selling things and making something useful to somebody. But I would have these wild ideas that I wanted to explore, and I felt like academia gave me a little better venue for that, to be able to have these, these big dreams and to be able to just do whatever you want. The, the beauty of academia is what I consider complete intellectual freedom. Now, there's a caveat, and that is that your great ideas have to be funded. So some of the advice that I give to my mentees uh, and my students now is become a really good communicator because you can have a great idea, but if you can't convince someone else that it's a great idea, it's never going to go anywhere. I got really good at writing proposals early in my career, in industry actually, and then later on in academia, and we have received millions of dollars of funding for our research. So I think that's a, a really key factor. What about you, Adrian? I fortunately had folks plant the seed early on. So when I was an undergraduate student, I had the good fortune of taking a course from a gentleman named Randy Pausch. And you might recognize this name from last lecture fame, that he passed away from pancreatic cancer. But it was an inspirational course to be able to take his usability engineering and understand about humans and design and whether we push versus pull the door, not because of our own intellect, but because of the way that thing spoke to us and the way it was made. And that just lit me up to be able to focus on that area of human-computer interaction. We were working on programming things called VCRs, you may remember. <laughs> <laughs> So this was just an exciting area within technology to be able to use my people skills as well. And then someone else who planted the seed to say, why don't you consider going back for a PhD? And at the time, I said, oh, I present really well. That's all that it takes, right, to be a, a, a successful professor. And the rest, the seed was planted and took root. Wonderful. So not just research, but the special area of brain-computer interface research. What got you into that, and do you have a background in neuroscience? Not one zip of background in neuroscience. I have three degrees in computer science, but what happened was I met a neurologist who was interested in this field, and I worked with him for many years. I absorbed everything I could. I um, learned everything that, uh, that possibly was out there about neuroscience. So I was inspired, though, to go into assistive technology because my grandmother, who I called Mimar, had MS. And she was completely paralyzed except for her left hand. And when I was a child, I never thought anything about that. I sat on her lap. We rode around in her wheelchair, which was a manual chair, by the way. She never even had a power chair. And she took care of herself. She raised three children. And she held down a full-time job as a librarian in their little town in West Point, Georgia. And as I became an adult, I realized how astounding this woman was. And I started thinking, what could she have done if she had a computer? 
And so that inspired me to raise puppies for service dogs and also to go into this field because there are people out there, there's half a million people worldwide who are locked in, which means completely paralyzed and unable to speak. They're thinking, feeling, understanding, just like you and I are, but they cannot communicate. And so I was very inspired to go and try to help this population of people. What about you? Well, does it count that I wanted to take marine biology just to dissect more stuff? <laughs> OK. Well, I think in my other life, it would be a neurosurgeon. So that's what I've channeled into this area of brain-computer interfacing, learning enough to be dangerous, but then taking the system's view. And I think that's the strength that I have brought, is being able to see end-to-end -end what is happening for a system and bringing in the best of neuroscience and computer science and incorporating that into an, a, interface that is useful to someone. And fortunately, meeting someone who has already gone ahead before me to open those doors within this very niche area of human-computer interaction. So when I met Melody, and that was when I was interviewing and looking at doctoral programs, I met her and instantly realized, I'm, I'm doing whatever she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the synergy. <laughs> You hear about her background, but I, I resonated with that. I saw this other person who was a geek with good social skills and <laughs> being to leverage that in this highly specialized area. But not only that, is that she saw me as a complete person. So I told her recently that she didn't realize she had signaled something to me when she started speaking about the historically black colleges and universities in the area. And just by that statement said to me, she recognized me as a black female. That's part of my whole identity. And it didn't have to be a, a big thing. It's just that she acknowledged, in just a very subtle way, seeing my complete self. And that's what I wanted to be able to bring to whatever environment is that someone saw me as a whole. <laughs> so bringing our full selves to areas, what has been your experience then as a woman in a technical field? Well, I may be an anomaly, but I really have never experienced any kind of traumatic uh, prejudice as being a woman in a technical field. I see being a woman as an advantage. Being the only woman in the room, which was a lot of my early career, I saw that as an advantage. I stand out. I'm unique. I get noticed. But the caveat here, and I'm, I'm full of caveats, is that you have to know what you're talking about. You have to be the expert in the room. You have to be useful. You have to be competent. And I, I stress this to all of my, my female students, and I've had quite a few. Be the expert in the room. Hone your communication skills. Mm -hmm. I think communication is probably the key in both industry, academia, any field that you go into. Being able to communicate clearly and, and you know, having those ideas and being able to, to communicate clearly. And certainly, I had bosses that didn't think women could do anything. I had a boss one time that gave all the coding tasks to the men, and the women were writing the documentation, which was a huge insult, because I was a better coder than most of the men. So what did I do? I left. Don't stay where you're not appreciated. Go somewhere else. Go where you will thrive. And, and don't let anybody ever compromise your morals, your ethics, or your ego. Stand up for yourself. Can I get an amen? <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so, how about you? What's been saying, and it wasn't necessarily improved a few years, just a few years later, in that <laughs> I absolutely found myself in all male groups where I'm pretty sure I said that about 10 minutes ago. Right? Had that phenomenon happen. Mm -hmm. But instead of marinating on it or dwelling on it, I said, that's OK. I'm a specialist in this area. And that's where you're going to pay attention. And that's where you're going to have to listen. And being able to shine in that expertise and, and resting on that. So that is where I drew excitement and focused on, on that specialty. So raising my hand, being in front of the room, asking those questions, never afraid to do those things uh, and, and be a standout. So I've enjoyed being able to, yes, be that social, uh, knowledgeable expert in the room in those particular areas. All right. So we shift a little bit. What is the hardest thing that you've had to do in your career? Well, there's a lot of hard things about working with people with terminal illnesses. Um, we work with these folks for years sometimes. 
especially people with late stage ALS, by the time they're locked in and we get to them, um, we're giving them a, a lot of hope, but also we lose them. They have terminal illnesses. And so we've lost every single patient we've ever worked with except one. We have one that's still, still out there and he's a force of nature. But you get to know these people, you get to know their families and their dear, dear friends uh, after we've worked with them and we lose every single one of them. That's been really hard. The other side of this though, as an educator, is that students come to us, they're brilliant. They're really smart kids. They come in, they've been told their whole lives that they're really smart and they need to get a PhD because you're smart, you need to get a PhD. Well, research is not for everyone. And there, it sounds glamorous, maybe, I don't know, maybe not. It sounds glamorous. There's a lot of tedium to research. You're reading 50 papers uh, in your field by other people. You are doing experiments that may not be so exciting. You're writing well into the night, which we're doing right now, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's just not always what everybody wants. And so sitting down with a student who's had their hopes and dreams shattered, and they're, they're, just, they're just struggling, and sitting down and saying, this isn't for you. Here's another door. That's probably one of the hardest things that we have to do. What's been hard about your career? I categorize it in two ways, both external and internal. The external being that in the field work that we do, and that we are literally rolling in with a bag of hope for these families that we are able to help unlock this family member to be able to communicate. And, and they know, they believe that that person is inside there, even when the other folks do not. And we're with them. However, this is experimental technology. And so it doesn't always work. And that, that can be devastating. No matter what the disclaimers, no matter what we say, you know, don't pin your hopes on this, this is still being worked out, there's still hope. And so if we can't get to the point of classifying the signal and getting a reliable uh, method of control out of this, that, that can be crushing. Yes. Now, the internal part for me is owning my own successes and not letting anyone else's narrative be placed upon me. My example there is, yes, I did write the proposals thanks to Melody, and I did get a great uh, federal fellowship out of that. And it was one of, I was the first one within my department to get that. Mm -hmm. But not everybody was happy for me. Mm -hmm. And so having a, another professor, a male professor, say, oh, so you think you're a diva now. <laughs> right? <laughs> I had him killed. <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. <laughs> How do, you, how do you move beyond that and not own that narrative and say, no, this is fantastic and I, I do not accept what you've just said to me. And further, if you were everything that you wanted to be, you wouldn't have said that to me, right? <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> So that's been an ongoing challenge though, right? Letting that light shine. So we'll end on this one. What's been the best thing? Oh. I get to ask you the yes. last question. So <laughs> continuing on, what's been the best thing? We just did the depressing part. What's the best thing about your work? Well, you heard us talk about bringing in hope. That's a highlight, absolutely. A personal highlight is also that I feel that I'm able to be an accessible role model to folks, to folks that look like me and maybe not as much like me, that this woman, this black woman, in a very highly technical, specialized area, is competent, knowledgeable, and doing incredible, incredible things. And more importantly, that I've got two little folks in my house that I'm able to show that to. So I have a billboard on the highway, by the way. But better than that, my five-year-old daughter made a poster on her presentation day of me as an inventor. <laughs> so, so absolutely, that's the best thing, to show them they can be whatever they want to be. So how about you? Well, to wrap up in five seconds, as many inventions as we've had, as many patents as I have, as many devices we've created, that's not really my product. I finally realize this as I start contemplating retirement eventually. My product that I'm most proud of is you. Aww. 
to be able to create a new generation of brilliant, confident, competent researchers that are going to carry on and go beyond my wildest dreams to change the world. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> We promise we wouldn't cry. <laughs> Thank you.